morning, ladies and gentlemen and programs. Welcome to this morning's presentation about DevOps is automation, DevSecOps is people. And of course, before we venture much further, I realize DevOps is a fancy term, so probably we should maybe define what it means, because otherwise, we could just throw around these terms, talk about people like there's some you know, mysterious group, you know, like the Druids. They're, no one knows who they were or what they were doing. So DevOps. The thing that I really want to focus about on DevOps is the automation aspect. So the idea here is that without automation, you will not scale. It's not that you can't scale, you just won't scale. And when I say scale, um, as we'll explore a little bit in, in, in the upcoming slides, I'm talking about both time and relative dimension in security, a, a TARDIS, if you will, in terms of dealing with hundreds of tens of thousands of systems, possibly even 100,000 systems, or th thousands of developers, or hundreds of different applications. So the things that are great about DevOps, so some of the principles of that automation, gives us the ability to scale, we can get some consistency in our environment, and even if we could talk a lot about those angles, but even if we just talk about patch management and asset inventory, two fundamental um, areas of security. And then of course, we can release code quickly. Ideally, we're doing it with confidence and we're releasing secure code, and that's a little bit what we want to talk about when we, when we say, what, what is DevOps, what is DevSecOps? Because the other aspect of this is that we want to make, you know, DevOps should be automatic for the people. And we want to, and with the understanding that when dev or developers and operations work together, they kind of, they build empathy. They realize that everybody hurts sometimes. That they understand what it takes to not just to build code, but to actually maintain it on production systems. And so that's what I really want to dive into. There's great talks, there's great topics, there's great lists, there's great things that, to say about here's how you deploy on AWS, here's secure coding for this particular programming language, this other particular programming language. And one of the other reasons that DevOps has become so popular, so big, has been enabled by the cloud. And one of the things I like to call about the cloud, as we're throwing around you know, fuzzy, foggy terms, is that it abstracts systems and deployment into an API. So now, rather than dealing with hardware directly, you can create bash scripts or a little bit more complex Python scripts or even more complex um, CI CD pipelines that are handling everything from your line of code to your line of systems. What we don't have are APIs for people. You know, how do we interact with people? Because we're building apps that people hopefully are using. We're building, we're working f for people. We're working with people. It's not like these are um, AIs that are just sitting around talking to each other alone and no humans are involved. Fundamentally, the security aspect of DevOps comes down to people. And that's kind of the, 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 the gist that I want to, to push on here. And if you picked up on some of the subtle references I was trying to make, is that yes, um, you know, DevSecOps is made of people. It's a call out to Soylent Green, a movie from the early 70s that in turn was based on a book from the mid 60s called Make Room, Make Room by uh, Harry Harrison. And one of the things I want to riff on here is that the idea of DevSecOps, the idea of focusing on people, how do we communicate, how do we work with them, is we want to make room for more people. We can continue to throw out that trope that there are, there's far too much code to secure, far too many systems to secure, and far too few people to do so. So how do we make room for more people to take part in that? So I mentioned, you know, I've, I mentioned the 60s, the, uh, then the 70s. Let's go, let's turn our attention now. I don't want to dwell on the past to a much more important decade, which is, of course, the 80s. So the 80s brought us, you know, more people have computers, more people have modems, there was more cybercrime. So one of the other things about the 80s, it has some great movies, 1982, Tron. One of, the, one of the great quotes about it was, <clears throat> I don't want to bust out of here and find nothing but a lot of cold circuits waiting for me. The idea here was that 
in, this, in the movie, the characters were fighting for the users. And when we start to talk about threat models, we should be fighting for the users. When we're starting to talk about building security into applications and considering what that security is, we should also be considering who the users are and what that context is. So for example, we can take something like the OWASP top 10 and understand here are technical issues, SQL injection, cross-site scripting, missing CSRF tokens, that type of thing. But there's a lot of context about the people that we'll get to in a little bit. So one final point just wanted to uh, emphasize that people also create these applications. People are working, you know, these, building these DevOps pipelines. And if we are security people trying to sit upon high and command thou shalt do this, that, you know, adhere to the OWASP top 10 standard, so to speak, which already is a bit problematic if you put it that way, or if we just say go fix this, or we run some source code scanners or some dynamic application scanners or some vuln scanners and say, here's your manifest of problems, go fix them. We've kind of missed the point that we need to be working with people as well as understanding how we're building applications. So as we jump around time and talking about APIs, or you know, what the actual problems are that users are running into, I like to call out or call attention to a 1999 paper called Why Johnny Can't Encrypt. And it essentially it explains why everyone to this day is barely using encrypted email and barely using PGP for that matter. So what it, dive, what it, what it um, explored was saying you have some fantastic math you have some asymmetric key pairs, you know, public private keys, et cetera, et cetera, but no one uses it. And it explained why that usability factor was. It explained who are the people that perhaps need encrypted email but can't use it because PGP is too cumbersome. So it's not like this is necessarily a new concept. What I'm trying to do is bring a couple more perhaps lists and things that we can focus on, and we'll see that in some upcoming areas. But one of the other things I wanted to also do was to help to shift perhaps some perspective or shift some attitudes. Because if we think that users are stupid or devs are lazy, what we're really doing is just building some fantasy campaign in our, our world about you know, what we think users are like or what we think developers are like. When in reality, it's, a lot, it's perhaps a little bit different. And this is where we'll start to talk and shift into that idea of politics. Politics with a small p, but politics in the sense that we're working with people and we need to change behaviors. We need to understand how to communicate and interact with them. And I understand that saying politics is just as a, you know, fraught with danger as trying to argue it about, about tabs versus spaces, but it's a little bit necessary. And since um, this is a nice, uh, a nice quote, uh, war is the continuation of politics by other means. We do actually want to avoid war in this case. We want to avoid cyber war because I don't want to even try to try to define that term. So we've already, you know, we've already stumbled over DevOps perhaps a little bit. So politics. So diving into some more practical aspects. So one of the major aspects of DevOps is this CI/CD pipeline. The idea that from, de from development to deployment, we have a lot of touch points. We have a lot of different people who are focused on particular responsibilities, particular tasks, but they're aware from start to finish what's going on. What's interesting about the DevOps approach, about the CI/CD pipeline, about cloud deployments, is that quite a bit they've rearranged security uh, uh, boundaries. So you don't quite have that separation of duties in the sense of a pure sysadmin. Because if I as a developer can commit some code that changes the behavior or affects running, you know, running systems, I'm acting like a sysadmin, for example. Or if I can also commit some code that extracts secrets that are stored in production systems, I, I, as a developer, can possibly be breaking those security boundaries because secrets that are in production should stay in production versus secrets that are in a staging environment or in a, develop or in a development environment. But one of the other things, having this pipeline, it enables the idea of having 
touch points for security checks. And one of the best ways or, or, one, or a successful way that I've seen and a successful way that I've seen when I've talked to people is adding security to where the developers are to, or where the developers live, meaning that CI CD pipeline. And one of the ways to do that is to say, at what point are you running a linter on your system? At what point can we add a security check to that? Or reframe it in the sense of not a security check, but a code quality. So in the sense of not a pass-fail in terms of you have a vuln, but did you even know a vuln existed? So the idea of saying, uh, of introducing what do developers care about and focusing on that. The other thing is if we're talking about um, sharing secrets, that there is not so much user passwords, but all these services. So services in cloud environments are very much trust, they have to trust each other. It's no longer necessarily IP to IP and just something like blacklist blacklisting IP addresses and firewalls. They need to talk to each other and present identity. And that's very much like the password problem that we'll um, talk about in a little bit. So trying to pull us back, rather than go through a litany of um, technical lists like the OWASP top 10, what I'd like to try to highlight are where, or, you know, or say and inspire, where are our lists of other topics? How do we communicate effectively? How do we build empathy? What should we do to take action rather than just build awareness? Because it's one thing for us just to say, yeah, we're interested. It's another thing to actually follow up on doing that. And then, of course, that important aspect of feedback. So <clears throat> if you ever want a crash course in something like interpersonal skills or communication, try running triage for a bug bounty program. You will be introduced to a wide variety of personalities, a wide variety of skill levels, and a wide variety of technical accuracy. So it's one of the things that, that um, you don't know who's on the other end of a bug bounty report. All you have is an email and the personality that comes out through that email. And of course, if we're dealing with a potential something that's a vulnerability that could be a potential breach, we do want to be able to react, respond effectively and focus a conversation on what is being discussed here. What is an impact? Um, and so this is why well-performing bug bounty programs, they'll dive into things like setting expectations, explaining a scope. This is what we, these are the types of vulns we're looking for. These are the types of vulns we're not looking for. Also, these are the types of content, or this is, this is the way to submit successfully. You know, explain, um, explain what's go what you found, explain how you understand its impact, and at, in other words, adding context. And finally, you know, you can suggest what might be a fix, but at least say what's, you know, at least be able to say, here's something that I think is a problem so that you on the receiving end can respond to it. So there are risks that can go um, just like there are risks in developing applications, like we'll, we can introduce SQL injection vulnerabilities, we can in introduce cross-site scripting. There's also a lot of risks, and this is an incomplete list of merely three when we communicate. So one can be ambiguity, and this easily goes into that aspect of bug bounty reports. You know, if somebody says, I found a vulnerability that I and, I could pro and I could take down your web server, do you have a bug bounty program? You know, already it sounds like somebody's phishing. Or if they say, I have a cross-site scripting and I could delete everybody's accounts, you know, how much will you pay for that? It sounds, again, there's some ambiguity there. Are they just phishing for a, a, a payment? And one of the aspects of that is the idea of uh, incentivizing. And when, when you're measuring something or when you're offering incentives, what kind of behavior is coming out of that? But to focus on, so there's other aspects that will step back a little bit higher level, you know, not just talking about um, bug bounties, but talking about more in general. And this is a common theme that you'll see within conferences uh, that you've seen e quite easily in the last uh, several years, that concept of either erasure and essentializing. So these are things to be aware of in the sense of when you communicate with people. Are you diminishing the impact of team members' contributions? Are you ignoring their, their contributions when you're in meetings or when you're presenting results to 
the board, if you're at that level, or when you're presenting results to peers, if you're at that level. The idea of, did everyone, did everyone get attribution and acknowledgement? Attribution is also important for even things like uh, presentations. So you notice I haven't done a fantastic job here of um, crediting where all these uh, photos have come from, or even linking to um, external ref uh, references. But that's another way of making sure and providing acknowledgement and attribution that we can make sure that people who have done work beforehand, for example, written a 1999 paper about security and usability, can be recognized for what they've done a decade ago, two, decade ago, two decades ago in building this. Um, and in the interest of time, skipping ahead real quick, Empathy. Empathy is the other important aspect to keep in mind, too. This is a sense of when we communicate, how are we listening? In other words, active listening, either to ourselves as we're speaking, as well as when someone is speaking to us. There are some easy ways to demonstrate empathy. You can simply acknowledge that, uh, you know, I understand what you're telling me. It's the idea of if you've heard of like improv or if you've heard of the yes and principle, rather than negating someone, you can say, you don't say, yes, and you're wrong. You say, yes, and here's something we can do to improve that. Or yes, and here's a threat model that maybe you didn't think about because this particular user is in a different group or has different concerns than you're thinking about. And repeating back, simply saying, I heard you say X, is that correct? These are easy ways of just building empathy and understanding what's going on. Uh, empathy is also even that subtext of the DevOps mentality, meaning developers' operations are sharing those responsibilities of building and maintaining software. So it's th it is throughout InfoSec, it's throughout the tech world, it's also just throughout conferences and interacting with people um, in general. And a good way to sort of tie together the, the concept of communication skills and empathy is look at codes of conduct. Now, um, even this conference has a, co has a code of conduct. Many others do. This is taken from Golang. But one of the reasons um, to highlight this is that as developers, we learn a lot by reading other people's code. We learn algorithms, we learn good ways to prevent cross-site scripting, we learn good ways to um, deal with AWS APIs, for example. We read code a lot, it's a great learning experience. What we can also do as a learning experience individually, read codes of conduct, look at how different ones are written, look at what they emphasize, look at what they're, they're doing. They're, for example, setting expectations, how they're defining what conflict resolution might be or what consequences might be. And the idea is that, and understand how they foster participation uh, within either a, a programming language product, project or within a conference or within a company, within a different type of organization. So the idea here is, where are some resources we can go to just to learn and to practice? Because these are all ongoing processes. One would be read codes of conduct. Another great thing would be read advice columns. Um, it's a, reading advice columns is a great way to see how to respond, demonstrate empathy, and also be concise. Because a lot of times you may have a limited word, word limit. So if you ever wanted to like you know, go for an untapped market, start an advice column for bug bounty reports or for bug bounty triagers. Um, I th I'm sure there, there's some, some rich material there that you'd be able to, to go through. Um, and, you know, I would also call out one of my favorites, just unrelated to tech, happens to be called Captain Awkward. Fantastic type of advice column. So the other way to practice is to play some role-playing games. So, and role-playing games I'm a big fan of, because they are collaborative storytelling, people working together for open-ended goals, and they're communication exercises. They're basically talking. They're full of tables, they're full of lists, they're full of appendices, they have more tables, they have dice and randomness, much like, you know, the OWASP.org uh, website has a bunch of lists of secure coding for this language, lists of a top 10, you know, there's randomness, who's going to be breached this year, how many records are going to be breached. So there's some parallels here. There's also some parallels if we want to figure out who we're working with. Um, as an aside, for example, in the early editions of D&D, the barbarian was illiterate, which if you've ever tried to read somebody's Perl code, I think supports my argument here. 
Um, but of course, you know, we have character classes, we have different ways that, you know, uh, we can put together our, our adventuring party within AppSec. And of course, not to be neglectful of more, you know, screenshots, role-playing games have threat models. Then in this case, you have a nice list of what could happen when you open a chest, you know, what's this treasure guarded by. But more applicable, if you've played role-playing games, um, you start to recognize there are other risks, there are other threats that come up that we can generalize from. Splitting the party. For example, lack of coordination, having lone heroes, having um, people run off and do their own thing. In an AppSec environment, this is often could be shadow IT or shadow development. These are threats to an organization. So how do you, you know, and they have dire consequences in role-playing games. Um, in shadow, you know, shadow development can have dire consequences as well. Maybe um, uh, API keys are sitting on systems that you didn't realize. You know, at the worst case scenario, maybe API keys are being published to GitHub. Or maybe shadow development is bypassing the, the key stores and the, the HSMs that you're requiring use, but they're too cumbersome to use. You can have unknown attacking the darkness. Um, you can have unknown targets or ambiguous goals. And we'll talk about metrics a little bit in terms of what's a good goal to work towards and how would you measure even getting that. So touching the statue, what always happens in role-playing games is that when you touch a statue, it animates, turns into a monster. So, and, uh, but you always keep doing it. So it's the, other, the idea of we're going to keep repeating something that we know that there's a bad outcome for. Again, this is a principle behind application development. If you've been handing off vulnerability reports that are long lists that you've removed all the false positives from, but still a long list of a mix of high and low critical vulns to your developers, and they're still not getting fixed, and you're expecting them to get fixed, but they never do, maybe there's something wrong with that approach. And of course, uh, when combat starts, because combat always starts, you have to roll for initiative. The idea there, regardless of how prepared you're going to be, there's going to be some random element. But having process, having DevOps that can be fast deployment, as well as having DevOps that has significant logging and visibility into your systems, basically helps you prepare and react to that type of randomness. I'll also show off some more tables, but extol the benefits of experimenting with role-playing games because they build a lot of other interpersonal skills, social skills. So you have to go through all types of things of compromise, negotiation, patience, team building. So one of the things that we could do more directly, perhaps, in your organizations is you know, start some role-playing game groups or open up something like office hours. Set a application security office hours See who shows up find, and talk to people from an open-ended perspective and find out what are they concerned about. You might surface some of that shadow development, but you will also practice trying to explain what cross-site scripting is for perhaps the 100th time or maybe the 200th time. But running office hours can be a good way of understanding and building empathy to figure out what your users are worried about or what challenges they have and, s and find out what's the gap between the policies that security has in place versus what developers are actually trying to do. Um, so if we take that, if we continue that idea of building empathy, understanding fundamental problems, think about password compromises. It's very easy, it could be really fun to make fun of users for having weak passwords every time there's a password breach. But when, is the password breach you know, fundamentally a fault of the end user or is a weak password even you know, fundamentally a fault of the end user? Possibly not. Possibly a lot of it goes back to that idea of not only why Johnny can't encrypt, but why Jane can't have a strong password. Because it's really cumbersome to have a different password for every single application. This is why we've seen the emergence of password managers. Um, uh, tools on your laptop that will handle this, select them for you. So again, we saw a problem and recently um, have seen, I say perhaps the last five years or so, um, it's been much larger growth of people who are able to have their passwords man chosen and managed for them. Another thing to highlight is the idea of threat models. 
So what are people actually worried about? So one of the reasons, perhaps, people don't have very, you know, wide variety of passwords is just too cumbersome to deal with them. But also, how are people using applications, or how are they being threatened by them? So if we look at, for example, the OWASP top 10 list, which again, um, I mean to use as a reference and a point of departure. So this doesn't say the OWASP top 10 list is bad or incomplete in any way. It serves a very specific purpose. But if you look at a lot of the threat models behind it, or if you talk about like web application pen testing, one of the things that often comes up is the idea of, we test for flaws in business logic. That's good, that's effective, but sometimes what, what have, have those business logic flaws been fully thought through in terms of how they might be used for abuse? So for example, um, on Twitter or on GitHub, being able to create a list that is insulting to people. So here's a list of LARPers, for example, those live action role players, and I'm just gonna add Mike to it because I wanna embarrass him and make this public. There's nothing wrong with the business logic there. That's a social abuse. It's a social problem that could potentially be enabled by the platform. And there's people who have talked about this, for example, um, in GitHub repositories, in social media. But the idea there is if you're looking at business logic and focused on can I use business logic to elevate privileges or to bypass a security control, you may be missing what, a what is a uh, threat to other people who are users of this application, who don't want to have their personal photos shared, who don't want to have to be forced into conversations um, without being, being able to opt in. In other words, like being forced added to conversations, things like this. And of course, there's a lot of aspects to privacy, um, which I have an asterisk there because that's probably a whole talk in and of itself. I apologize, I take a drink of water. Um, but as we're, sh as we're looking around from threat models, building awareness of what we should be worried about, let's not forget that we also be, should be building constructive solutions. So a great example, I, th I think, of a DevOps solution or something that enables DevOps is the Let's Encrypt project. So ever since at least 1999, if not before then, a lot of People at conferences, a lot of people on the, on the web have said, use HTTPS, encrypt your website, encrypt your website. So it's all fine to say and do, but that's not very constructive, it's not very participative, and it doesn't build empathy for why, what are the real reasons you know, m so many websites don't have HTTPS deployed. And if we think about like users choosing their own passwords, key rotation and just key management alone is a significant, is critical to being able to deploy effective HTTPS. So it's like basically password management for your website. What Let's Encrypt did was address both that initial cost, so here's your budget of zero, here are free certs, and now here is an easy way to build this into your CI-CD pipeline. So rather than just yell and scream, go turn on HTTPS, they created a solution that acknowledged what the challenges were, and I think, are, and I fingers crossed, are responsible for improving an uptick in adoption because they're working with DevOps teams, having the empathy to understand what their challenges are, and introducing solutions to be able to help that. So. I sort of cheated there a bit and gave you a, a hand wavy sense of claiming that Let's Encrypt is improving HTTPS and adoption. What we should also be able to do as we talk about communication, as we talk about taking action, is we should be able to observe and measure what we're doing. In other words, we want to be able to inform the decisions that we're making. We want to gain some insights in the AppSec world around us. We don't just want to be living in a world of awareness where I'm just saying, you should pay attention to this, you should care, you should care. You know, parents just don't understand all of these problems. Um, uh, but uh, but um, here is where, again, I'd repeat and emphasize the idea of running office hours. Go ahead and have that on a weekly basis with the only goal being to talk to people and understand. And then turn, then turn from office hours into deciding what are some meaningful metrics you want to tackle. What's some, what's some 
not ambiguous goal, but what's some goal that you can measure, what's some goal you want to achieve, rather than just a number. And I have a um, case study that I'll show in a minute about what that means. Because what we want to try and do, like the bug bounty situation, we want to be careful about what, ins what we're measuring or what we're incentivizing, because if we're incentivizing the highest vulns, get the highest payouts, a lot of times it, it can turn into that um, notorious big bounty scenario when someone says, uh, well, this other company paid you know, X dollars for this and you're only giving me half, that doesn't make sense. Or you know, if the planets were to align and the great, great conjunction were to happen and the same origin policy failed, then I could steal somebody's password. That's a bit of a, a nebulous claim there. So. Let's turn to a case study of um, something I worked on in terms of communication, empathy, as well as measuring. So uh, we see a lot of, where I work, we see a lot of vulnerabilities from d many, many different pen tests. What we notice is that it's one thing, again, to raise awareness, you have lots of problems. It's another thing to actually go and fix them. So here are vulnerabilities, let's actually address them, let's actually make um, applications more secure. What we notice is that verifying that, that vulns were fixed was pretty slow. We couldn't track even when, it, when, uh, when, when something was, it was asked to be retested. So they say, ah, this is fixed, can somebody go verify this? We couldn't even track that when that happened. Um, also, notifications weren't prioritized, another failure of communication, saying that this critical vulnerability is ready for retesting or is ready to be v verified was the exact same priority as, by the way, Mike just commented on this particular um, vulnerability that you know, is still being explored. So there was, there was a, a failure of communication there and there was a problem. So one of the things that I like to emphasize in terms of metrics is time. Time is very important. Um, if I want to riff on a Cindy Lauper song, um, if you're lost, you can look and you'll find me measuring time after time. One example here was when we were improving how long it took to close vulnerabilities. So it wasn't until August that we kind of saw, hmm, we have a problem, we're doomed. In August, we added a timestamp that also tracked when people, when developers said, hey, I'm fixed, I've fixed this, can you verify it? So we went from that top line that was you know, well over 90 days to fix a vuln, and we're, are, we were just going for 30 days. Um, you know, uh, ideally, it would be lower, but let's do something attainable. We can't go from 90 days to nine days. That's unreasonable. So we were going for 30. And as you can see, our arc was, uh, was very, the gap was pretty separate, but then arcing back down, and hopefully throughout 2018, uh, which I think we're in the year now, I've been doing a lot of time traveling here, is that these numbers will mostly be together. So most vulns will only take about 30 days to resolve. So again, we're focusing on a number. What we did was, communicate that this is important and say we want to get a number down to, we want to reduce the number. And so we saw that when we were communicating that, we saw that it was pretty active. We had a little bit trouble scaling it because it was a lot of hands-on reaching out, talking to people, emailing them, following up. But the other question is, did we make an impact? And so what I've produced here is another time and relative dimension in space in this case, because I just want to make more TARDIS references. Um, what's in blue are the when the number of vulns at that particular month and that particular res risk level, over 50% of them have been resolved. So you can see uh, there's a nice, at least there's a nice clumping near the top where 50% or more of the vulns have been resolved. But if we go to 90 days, it kind of disappears. So we've reduced the time that was taking to resolve vulnerabilities, but perhaps we were resolving fewer vulnerabilities, or we still have a lot of work to do. So this was an example of measuring against one dimension. In this case, we're measuring time. We were managing to reduce time, but we also need to step back, use some take, you know, um, uh, do you use some introspection, query the broader picture and figure out, are we really reducing risk like we want to? Or now that we've reduced down to 30 days or we're getting very close to that, what's going to be our next step in saying, let's pick out something that's attainable. So rather than turn the entire chart blue, let's focus maybe on the upper line, the top three, so you know, the most high to the very high. 
Because one of the other things, if we start to collect data and we start to talk to people and communicate with them, we might see, what do people just not care about? So in this graph, um, here is the average number of days it took across all the vulnerabilities to be resolved. And then this was fewer than the average, greater than the average days. And you see down here at the bottom, redirects and forwards, no one cared about them. They just weren't getting fixed. And in a way, if you've been following the, uh, the latest changes to the OWASP top 10, you know, redirects and forwards fell off that list. So this kind of resonates with that. So one of the things we could even say here is, you know what, developers, don't even bother with this. Don't even fix them. And we're not even going to report them. So again, here's another way to choose a strategy and say, all we care about in this case, or what we most care about, is reducing the time to get something fixed. And we're only going to focus on misconfigurations, or we're only going to focus on something that has been rated very high. So we're going to take incremental steps, and we're going to make it easier for that DevOps team to understand, to attain, and to, to go after it. So some other things that we're, we could try to do, um, and what would be fun, at least for me, would be to take that, those graphs, come back next year, and say, here are some things that we hypothesize and try, and what happened. Because there's also some usability things that we might try. What if, in addition to saying, here is your vulnerability, here's how many days old it is, here in parentheses is the average number of days for vulns at this criticality level. In other words, it's much more the idea of carrot, in the sense of carrot than stick. We're providing information, we're providing information about your peers to see will people then try to change their own behavior and drive this number down. And we'll see in a year from now if any of these hypotheses work, and we'll see that how that 30 days goes down and how that time and space matrix changes. So really what that kind of emphasizes and why I wanted to call that out is that what we measure also reflects what we care about. So we shouldn't just collect numbers and metrics because we can have them. We should gather them or create them or track them because we care about something. But also, subtly, and I'm going to step up and you know, introduce some more politics perhaps in a, in a second, is what we care about also reflects our environment in the sense of um, what are we measuring, what do we see around us, and what do we want to change. So, I guess I've been jumping back to the 80s quite a bit, but it's not just for the sake of nostalgia. Some of it is um, understanding history of technology, history of computers, history of usability, looking at why Johnny can't encrypt. And a lot of these uh, screenshots that I've been taking, taken uh, were, are from a magazine from the mid-80s. And in this case, here is a table they provided um, that was about computer camps. And so in the computer camps, they explain the types of instructors, the languages that are taught. So those of you um, who are Pascal fans, Pascal was being taught back then. It did exist. Um, Apple, Commodore, my personal favorite, and uh, boy-girl ratio. One of the senses, and the reason I highlight this, is that the magazine that this is from is, um, was published by the Children's Television Workshop, uh, the people who brought us Sesame Street. So it was targeted at an audience, and they understood their audience. They understood what are their concerns, or they anticipated what might be their concerns. In other words, they were measuring something that they cared about. They were understanding who they were talking to, and they were also gathering that data. So for me, when we were fixing vulns, we cared about driving down the number of days to fix vulns. We also cared about the criticality of vulns, and we saw what was working and what wasn't working. So just to reiterate, it's sort of like, what are you choosing to measure? How are you measuring that? And are you only choosing a metric because it's available? And these are um, loosely based questions, but they, what they really tie into is concepts of cognitive biases. So here is a list of, I'm going to count real quick and get it right, I hope, six of roughly 20. Um, and I'll provide a link to a more complete list um, later on. But if you're to walk away from the OWASP conference, you know, re refreshing your memory of the OWASP top 10, maybe a top 10 list about deploying to a cloud environment, and the top three things to learn about to do to secure um, you know, private keys in Jenkins and Chef, 
Another list to learn about and to instill would be cognitive biases. Um, and my idea here is not to try to go through each one, but to introduce them as part of that shared vocabulary. So that when we have conversations about collecting metrics and when, and when we're trying to change behavior, or when we're trying to communicate, what might be some of the problems that are creeping in that are threats or weaknesses to those metrics or how we're communicating? So that, that might be introducing problems that might be changing or, in, or infe uh, the, infecti affecting in a negative manner what we're trying to do. So in a, as a quick example, um, so there's a bias called clustering illusions. So one idea is we have lots of vulns or we have few vulns. Or if you, have, if you follow the idea of um, vuln rediscovery, um, it, we can see a lot of, we, we don't ha basically have good data on how many vulns are out there. If we go back to talking about bug bounty programs, just because one app has lots of vulns that are discovered in it doesn't necessarily mean the other app you know, a similar app is going to have a lot of vulnerabilities. Um, just because a bunch of vulnerabilities are low-hanging fruit or low risk doesn't mean that tied together they can necessarily be, be uh, a very significant vulnerability. Um, and there's also information bias. It's just the other one I wanted to highlight. And that's the idea of big data. So that will be the last of the, the, the buzzwords that I use during this presentation. But big data is in the sense of you know, scale or having lots of data, but that doesn't necessarily mean you have more quality data. So for example, in big data, um, when we were looking at fixing vulnerabilities, the timestamps were actually technically, they went down to, I think, the microsecond. Um, so that's awesome. So we have the fix verification down to the microsecond. Who cares? We're dealing with days. So that's just one example of we don't necessarily more accuracy or more, num you know, more, uh, more accuracy or more refinement within a number it doesn't always carry you know, more meaning, as well as just having lots of data doesn't necessarily mean you can make better decisions. It also means if we tie back to threat models and the idea of who our different users are or who our different audiences are and what they might be threatened by, Big data could, and having lots of numbers or just collecting numbers for numbers sake can also be a threat. Um, very topically, if you've been jogging around any uh, bases in the last, uh, you know, last couple of weeks or I guess in last, um, from 2015 on, you might want to disable your Strava account because it's, uh, been very, um, it's very entertaining to see how both big data demonstrating nice outlines of military bases or just installations where people jog highlight around the world. It's also an example of um, talking about privacy or talking about de-anonymization. So we can say that we have big data, or we can say that we're collecting data, and maybe it's anonymized, but how well do we think it can be de-anonymized? So again, these are threats. So if we were going to go through an, an additional top 10 list and be below like insecure use of cryptography, um, I can't remember off the top of my head all the you know, insecure APIs, the OWASP top 10, we could have another OWASP top 10 list around privacy threats, perhaps. And one of the things that I wanted to highlight and demonstrate is an example of interrogating what we're doing. So one of the things that I mentioned already that should be fixed here is that I don't have enough references here or callbacks to people who've done a lot of this work or a lot of the inspiration I've taken from it. One of the things, too, is that D&D &D and role-playing games absolutely love them. However, they've gone through their own evolutions of social interactions. Um, in the early games, um, based, if you, if, you, if you remember, saw the you know, users, developers, and the different races, um, human males and human females in the game had different maximum limits on their strength um, scores. So a fantasy world, arbitrary limit. Over a long period of time, there's a lot of discussions around and justifications on why this is, you know, why, you know, why different heroes should have these these limitations, but no longer is that the case. But I just call it out because the other reason is I use that as a metaphor, but perhaps not everybody's aware of it. So maybe there's a weakness there. Um, if you're not aware of it and want to start playing, I thoroughly encourage you to do so. Buy some dice, find some people online, you and, and um, you can start, start playing. But the other idea here is also the idea of knowing your audience. So 
winding down, if we talk about having lists, having a list of cognitive biases, understanding what those are, how to speak to them, is an important takeaway, I think, something to, to keep in the back of your mind because it influences how we actually go and do things like fix vulns, add security to our CD, CI, CD pipelines. If we're also to start to propose or brainstorm something beyond that OWASP top 10 list, what could we do is to present, you know, what could we do that's constructive? Here are some OWASP top 10 patterns of how to handle account recovery, how to do this at scale, when you might have 1 billion users, and if 1% of them run into problems, you're still talking about a magnitude of millions of users. So that's why scale and DevOps um, introduces lots of different challenges. Password storages. It's not only a problem for users, how to choose a long password, it's also a problem within CI/CD pipelines. How do you have, have different um, keys and service accounts in, in development, staging, production? How do you keep them separated? Um, software dependency management. You know, very simple, basic problems. Um, as well as calling out anonymization and abuse. So when you start to talk about and do your threat modeling for the applications, is for, you know, with your AppSec hat on, talking to the DevOps teams, start to explore how comprehensive those threat models might be. What are some additional things you could call out there around running or you know, making outlines um, based on your jogging behavior, things like that. So this is not to say that we shouldn't continue to do some fantastic presentations, look for people who are identifying architectural security flaws, you know, presenting technical solutions. Here's how to improve uh, Jenkins, here's how to improve Chef, here's how to improve other tools that are used throughout them. But we're working with people. So see, how can we, you know, who's implementing them? How can we insert security into what a DevOps team is doing? And how can we build applications for the people that w and how people are using that application? So the other thing is to build some metrics so that it's not just passive awareness and it's just that, oh, please know about this or please be mindful of these items or these areas. Figure out what could we do to Pick one, you know, pick one goal and work towards it. How could we work towards it? How could we review, seeing if we've done something? The other thing to call out here is you know, meaningful understanding and not using something like the OWASP top 10 list or uh, as, a, as a stick to say, you have cross-site scripting, go fix it. Because, all all, because not all cross-site scripting is created equal. If you have a self-XSS and a cookie, it's very unlikely to be exploited. Just treat it like a bug like you would any other bug. If you have a reflected cross-site scripting in a calendaring function, maybe that's a little bit more meaningful. So that's the idea there. And what I'll leave you with is um, one final quote that AppSec is the continuation of DevOps by their own means. So the idea that working with people, using communication, using empathy, taking some measurable action and then reviewing that action with feedback and seeing was it, was it change in behavior, that can be something that adds security to your, um, to your DevOps. So thank you. Um, or as the MCP in Tron would say, end of line. So I believe I saved us Oh, only one minute, so I miss, I miss, I miss, miss timed it. Um, I would love to take questions. Um, feel free to, to contact me. I'll be posting slides. I'll be hanging around here, wandering probably near the coffee, and I'll uh, be more than happy to continue the conversation and uh, as well as take feedback. Thank you very much again.